Well, thank you for having me, Gary, once again, and uh, saying, saying hello to your audience. Well, tonight we're going to talk about Billy Lovelady. Billy Lovelady, obviously, very well known in, within the JFK uh, research community because Billy is, has been identified by the Warren Commission and the House Select Assassination Committee as being the man in the doorway, man in the doorway in the famous Alton Six photograph. Billy Lovelady has a very, very interesting background and in, uh, in the story uh, that we're going to tell tonight here. I think it's going to be very, very interesting. Uh, so we're going to focus on. So we're going to focus on Billy Lovelady tonight, because of course, all right, Larry, we're going to get into Billy Lovelady tonight in a way that no one has brought this type of evidence when it comes to Billy Lovelady, and we want to make everyone aware that we're bringing new research to the JFK community. Yeah, well, I put together a lot of information on Billy Lovelady uh, by doing FOIA requests on his military records a couple of years ago, going through a lot of other records that are found on the internet, for example, in the Mary Farrell website, the Harold Weisberg website at Foot College. We put together a lot of pretty good background on Mr. Lovelady. I, I just want to go through the information that we have here. Most researchers know that Billy Lovelady worked at the Texas School Book Depository. He was supposedly caught in the Alton 6 photograph and identified as the man in the doorway. Mm -hmm. And the Alton 6 photograph has been extremely controversial because many people believe, and I'm one of those, uh, that it, it has been heavily altered. Yes. And uh, we've put this uh, photograph through modern computer techniques which identify areas of uh, alteration. But right now that's not really what we're going to talk about. We're going to talk about Billy Lovelady and his background and how he arrived at the uh, Texas School Book Depository and the circumstances the circumstances under which he did arrive to uh, obtain an employment there. I just wanted to start here by saying that uh, the release of FBI documents pertaining to Billy Lovelady, um, well, they make this individual a person of extreme interest in ways that had never been considered before. The controversy surrounding his presence in the Alton 6 photograph must now be viewed in an entirely different light. The dean of the early researchers, Harold Weisberg, wrote entire chapters devoted to this, where he protested the manner in which the Lovelady affair had been conducted from day one by the FBI and later the Warren Commission. I just wanted to comment that if Weisberg had known then what we know now, uh, he would have taken a, a whole different attack on Lovelady. So, mm -hmm. Yeah, Billy Lovelady was more than a guy just hauling books around. Oh, yeah. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Lovelady, uh, as we all know, was photographed in his red and white vertical striped shirts on February, February the 29th, 1964, by the FBI in Dallas. Okay, on uh, 11-22nd, during the assassination, he stated that uh, he was wearing a, a red and white vertical striped shirt and blue jeans. Mm -hmm. Now, at that time, the FBI was only a concern with making his shirt look like Doorway Man by leaving the top three buttons unbuttoned. Now, a little more than a month later, on 4 7 64, his sworn and unsigned deposition was taken by Joseph Ball, one of the commission attorneys. And in this exchange, he was shown a, a cropped version of the Elgin uh, 6 photograph. And it's very funny because it already had a, an arrow pointing directly at Doorway Man. Mr. Ball's uh, interrogation uh, of Lovelady was very vague and changed the subject at will and wasn't even interested in pursuing any new information uh, with Lovelady. Now, as an example, and for the record, and supposedly under oath, he was never asked a simple question of what shirt he wore that day. Now, later in May of that year, Tom Bonafide of the New York Herald Tribune wrote a, a very comprehensive and controversial article on this issue. Bonafide wrote about Jones Harris, and Jones Harris was the first investigator to actually commission enhancements of the Austin Six, and later both tried to photograph Lovelady and Dallas. This is important because Lovelady, after the assassination, avoided investigators and people that went to try to take pictures of him. I, I know uh, of an instance, for example, of Shirley Martin. This is a, a very cute story. It's Martin, uh, Shirley's son, told me about an incident where he and his little sister were told by, by their mother, Shirley, to go to the back of the building in 1964 when Shirley was going back and forth to, to Dallas, and Shirley, Shirley being from Oklahoma, one of the early investigators, she was just a housewife, took uh, a great interest in the case. 
and was one of the first investigators to uh, go and interview witnesses, actually, in, in Dallas. So anyway, she took, told uh, little Stevie to go and try to snap a picture of Love Lady. And as they were trying to, as they were coming out of the uh, Texas School Book Depository, as they were leading work, apparently he had problems with the camera and wasn't able to do it. Mm. But that just, just give, gives you an, an example of, of how Love Lady was actually hounded and, and, and so many people trying to uh, take pictures of him because of the uh, issue of right. the man in the doorway. Yeah, weren't there and, people um, camping out? It, in the, it, trying to catch him going in and out of work? Yeah, yeah, this guy by the name of Beckman, but the only photograph that they were able to snap of Love, of Love Lady was actually the one done by Mark Lane. And it's a photograph where he's actually looking down and you can't see his, his entire face. You know, it's sort of like a, 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 an incomplete image of, of, of Love Lady. So, yeah, this uh, guy by the name of Francis Beckman tracked uh, for two weeks. Uh, he was he was camping outside of the TSBD, standing out there with a camera, and every time Love Lady would come out of work, you know, he'd be trying to take a picture of Love Lady, and uh, in fact, one day, uh, his wife, uh, Patricia, went and assaulted him, and uh, there was a uh, case that was filed, you know, with the Dallas Police Department uh, regarding the incident. So if you get and caught taking a picture of Billy Love Lady, you, you can get in a fight in Dealey Plaza? <laughs> yeah, right here on Houston. <laughs> you know, we truly uh, told the man, just get out of town, you know, we're going to beat you up or something like that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so the, this uh, issue of, of Love Lady and, and uh, the shirt and everything, finally, in, in this uh, article that Bonafide wrote, he reported that Love Lady said he was an inch shorter than Oswald, he was heavier, and he was wearing that red and white striped sports shirt button near the neck. And this is important because uh, when, when the uh, FBI took that photograph of Love Lady, pertaining to that report that uh, February the 29th, they included uh, the photographs of Love Lady. And if you look at the photographs that the FBI took of him, the top three buttons are totally unbuttoned, which what they're trying to do here is trying to make him look like Doorway Man. Mm -hmm. so if you look at the, the figure of Doorway Man, which happened to be that uh, Lee Oswald's shirt uh, was missing the top uh, couple of buttons, two or three buttons. So that's why he, his uh, shirt was splayed open in the way that, it, that we see in, in the Altered Six. Very comically, the FBI was trying to recreate the effect uh, of the shirt. But the shirt looks yeah. nothing like the shirt in the doorway. Is no, it? no, not at all, because later on they, they changed it. They switched it over to, uh, to a plaid checkered shirt that uh, we're going to talk about in a minute here. But uh, then two years later, Weisberg uh, wrote White, Whitewash 2 in 1966, and he wrote some very important chapters there, the uh, Love Lady Diversion. And yeah, that's a pretty powerful name for a chapter in a book by Harold Weisberg, the dean of this Oswald in the Doorway, who seemed to have it right from the very beginning. Yeah, and the other uh, chapter was the Love Lady Caper. And in, the, in these two chapters, uh, Mr. Weisberg actually was the first researcher to make a point-by-point -point comparison of the uh, Man in the Doorway shirt, okay, and comparing it to the actual shirt that Lee Oswald was wearing on November the 22nd using images, pictures that were in the, in the public domain showing Oswald with the shirt that he wore at the, at the DPD that night. So anyway, he did it like, I think it was a nine-point comparison. Today, with modern computer uh, techni techniques and technology, Richard Hook has been able to expand that all the way to 50 points of uh, similarity between the man in the doorway and Lee Oswald, including facial uh, features and, and what have you. So, All right, so um, we want to go on record as you are completely of the belief that it was Lee Oswald in the doorway from all your extensive research. Oh, of course. Okay. Oh, of course. Uh, there's, there's no doubt. But we're going we're gonna to go on here and, and give more, more and more information on that. Questions kept arising regarding uh, Billy's shirt versus the, the one worn by Doorway Man. And here we go again with Josiah Thompson's uh, Six Seconds in Dallas, 1967. And he tried to reconcile this as well. And uh, the only problem is that some of his references, the references that he used were references that led, led nowhere. And I'll talk about that pretty soon here in this presentation. Now, in 1971, 
Yeah, this issue would not go away, and Lovelady was finally photographed in the doorway of the TSBD by Bob Jackson, and this time in a plaid, checkered, red, and dark shirt with the top button buttons unbuttoned. Now, if you look at this picture that Jackson took, apparently he, he never read uh, Billy Lovelady's one commission testimony, because clearly Lovelady, in his testimony, said he was, he was uh, standing on the top step of the doorway. In this picture that uh, Bob Jackson took, he's got him standing on the third step. So that right there, uh, sort of, and, and, and apparently he didn't uh, understand the the uh, issues involved with the Austin 6 photograph with the equipment that, uh, that Austin was using and the effect that you see in the uh, picture because of the uh, distance, the equipment, and everything seems to be in different positions in, in the Austin photograph okay so he didn't understand that and he went in and placed Billy on the third step and when you compare that to a doorman doorway man we know that he's standing on the top step so right there you can see the deception um, mm -hmm. involved you know with Bob Jackson okay now the story of the plaid shirt did not come full circle until the HSCA published its report in the late 70s and there's problems with that with that conclusion as we shall, we're, we're going to see in, in, in a few moments. Now, we, we need to go back now a little bit because we got we got to go a little deeper into uh, Billy Lovelady's background. See, Billy was enlisted into the Air Force in 1957. Got this information from the NPRC, and like I said in a FOIA request a couple of years ago, when he was in the in the Air Force, he was a member of the mili of military personnel attached to the. 1,001st Base Supply Squadron at Andrews Air Force Base. Billy's rank there was Airman Second Class, okay? The uh, date that he enlisted there was 12-3-1957. He went on a six-year tour. Now, during uh, 1960, and I looked this out, out of Washington Post uh, articles, there was like a gang, okay, of uh, airmen that were feeling some, some of it's kind of petty, you know, we're talking about sheets and masking tape and stuff like that, you know, and, and gear, you know, from the Air Force warehouse, selling it out off base. So, so there was a problem at Andrews in those days, in 1960. Like I said, Billy was involved in something a little bit much, much serious, much more serious than what we're talking about. Son, what Billy was into, uh, a couple of his friends were... Uh, Two airmen by the name of Williams and Kraus, and what they what they were involved in was selling guns, you know, off base. They would uh, steal the guns, all right. And in this case, on 93 or 94, 1960, they, there was uh, report, there were reported three Smith and Wesson guns that were stolen. Okay, they went to a bar and they tried to sell these. Apparently, whoever they were trying to steal, sell them to uh, reported them. They got in trouble for this, and they were identified in the in the line in the lineup uh, conducted by the OSI. A complaint was filed in uh, early September 1960 regarding the stolen revolvers. All three of them, uh, Williams, Carlson, and Lovelady, uh, admitted to the theft of the guns. Now, Carlson uh, was the one manipulating the records pertaining to the guns, and Billy was admitted to the sale of the gun. All right, now let uh, me get this straight here. We have Billy Lovelady convicted of stealing and selling guns from the United States Air Force? That's right. They uh, they were charged with uh, two counts of violations to Title 18 U.S. Code Section 641, which pertains to the theft of public uh, money, property, or records. These are serious uh, charges. To be, more, to be more specific, yeah, very serious, yeah. February the 10th, 1961, uh, Billy appeared in U.S. District Court in Baltimore for arraignment. On 3-17-1961, he was arraigned and he entered a plea, a plea of not guilty. Then, for some reason, he changed his mind, or his lawyer uh, made him change his mind, and he entered a plea of guilty. He apparently, he wanted to get it over with. Uh, he was fined uh, $200, and he was ordered to pay these in installments of $25. Okay, and uh, once that uh, was fulfilled, then uh, the, the indictment would be uh, dismissed. Now, once this happened, the, the, because that was in civil court, then once this happened, Billy and his uh, partners 
were quickly uh, court-martialed by, by their superiors and separated from the Air Force with a duty status of discharge. So Billy uh -huh. Lovelady was court-martialed. Not only was he prosecuted in civil court, he was court-martialed. That's right. Now, how do I know that he was court-martialed, uh, you might ask? Well, uh, let me, let me uh, tell you a little bit, uh, little bit about uh, the NPRC. There was a fire in 19, July of 1973 at the NPRC. Many, many records of military personnel were lost, specifically from the letter A to the letter Z. The only surviving records, and we're talking about from 1973 back, okay? The only surviving records were personnel up to the letter H. And in that, obviously, well, Krauss was one of the, uh, of the three Krauss's Krauss's records were the only ones that, that survived this fire. Love Ladies and Williams did not. When I tried to get Love, Lady, Love Ladies records, they were incomplete. All they could tell me was the date that he listed and the date that he was separated, but there wasn't, a, there wasn't any, any detail in his file. Now, when I ordered, I checked out the, for Krauss's record, record I, I found that, yes, it, he, there were indications that he had been court-martialed. So, since all three of them were together in this case, by inference, we have to assume that Billy was also court-martialed because all three were involved in the same gun, in, in the theft of guns and, and, and selling them. So we have Billy Lovelady is a fugitive by the FBI. So we've got three serious, serious things going on here with Mr. Lovelady. Yeah, well, see, then uh, what happens is that uh, once he gets discharged after only three and a half years in the Air Force now, Billy doesn't have anything, you know, any uh, way of, of making a living. In October, October of 1961, he stopped paying the $25 monthly installments of his fine. Then, two months later, he ends up at the Texas School Book Depository. And this is why they were still located at the Dallas building, okay? Now, the company, as we all know, the company did not move on into uh, the location of 411 Elm Street until the summer of 1963, all right? Now, fast forward, one year later, December the 7th, 1962, uh, U.S. Attorney Robert Carson reported that Billy had only paid $125 of his fine, $125 of the fine, and his last payment had been made over a year ago. At that point, his office started looking for him. They noticed that uh, all of the letters and any efforts to contact Billy were returned undeliverable, undeliverable, and at that moment, Judge Thompson issued a bench warrant for his arrest and a thousand dollar bail. Okay, and we'll come back uh, after the break. This is The Real Deal with Dr. James Fetzer and our special guest, Larry Rivera. We'll be right back. Hi, this is Gary King. Here's a cutoff from my album, Sometimes Less Is More, available on iTunes. If you dig it, download it. Get sometimes less is more on iTunes. Oh, we're talking about Billy Lovelady being in uh, quite a bit of trouble to be ending up at the Texas School Book Depository, and I'm wondering if this guy might not be a uh, potential. Uh, uh, we'll, we'll let you fill us in there. Go ahead, Larry. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, uh, December 1962. Billy's on the lam, okay, and he's uh, considered a fugitive, like you said, uh, by the FBI. January the 7th, 1963, he's arrested at the Texas Full School Book Depository Company, okay, let's not forget, at the Dow Tech Building. 
and he's incarcerated in Dallas, in the Dallas County Jail. Man, he's in trouble around town. Wow. Oh, big time. And he's a federal felon, you know, for a fugitive. And I mean, how do you, I mean, really, how do you get in trouble with the FBI? You have to be really trying hard. Well, you know, he skipped town in Maryland. You know, he skipped town and then they uh, sent for him. <laughs> Billy has got uh, good experience with the FBI in, in 1962, as, we, as we, we see here. In 1963, like I said, in January, Oshis Campbell, the vice president of the company, offers to pay the remaining balance of the Maryland fine if charges were dropped. Okay? Okay. So Billy was released on a $1,000 personal recognizance bond and then ordered to appear on 1963. On 1963, Billy appeared before the uh, U.S. Commissioner Hill and after several communications between Maryland and Dallas, U.S. District Court of Maryland agrees to dismiss the warrant once the $75 is received. And then he's released on his own recognizance. That's what we have here on Billy. Now, I, I want to I just talk about a little bit about the uh, Texas Employment Commission. And there's a lady that worked there by the name of Laura Cottrell. And Laura Cottrell is important because she was the counselor interviewer at the commission, at the Texas Employment Commission, the TEC. And she had experiences with both Lee Oswald and Larry Crawford. That's a whole different story that we don't have much time uh, okay. to go into, into uh, at this moment, because she actually interviewed both of them during uh, 1963 in the day in the fall of 1963 when Lee Oswald was trying to find a, a job at the Texas School Book uh, Depository. And a lot of the information that uh, and the files that she had worked on later on disappeared after the assassination. And she wrote a, a paper, a manuscript about her experience with Oswald and Griffard. It's a very, very interesting piece of work because this lady had a great memory and, and she, she really laid everything out at where, where it, it was very obvious that there was some very, very funny shenanigans going on at the Texas Employment Commission where Lee Oswald was being impersonated by this guy Griffard because later on she identified Griffard uh, in pictures that she saw in the one commission in some of the exhibits. That, that exists in the one commission uh, volume there. So anyway, Laura Cottrell in, in this document talks about, writes about how strict the uh, Texas School Book Depository Company was about their candidates. She had a lot of experience uh, with the uh, Texas School Book Depository Company with candidates who were candidates to go work there, and she would refer, she knew the human resources department there and everybody who worked there, and she was, she, she wrote about how finicky they were, if you will, about candidates and how they frowned on candidates with dishonorable discharges, mm. okay? So, so we find that Lovelady had no problem <laughs> getting yeah, hired man. <laughs> by the Texas uh, School Book Depository Company, okay, in 1961, as a running felon, okay? So there, there's something really, really strange about this, okay? Mm -hmm. How does he end up working for the company? It, it's sort of like, I think, that he might have also been, they tr might have been trying to set him up as an eventual patsy. It's kind of hard to visualize this from for so long. You know, so long a time before the assassination, if you look at the work of Armstrong with uh, Harvey and Lee and, mm -hmm. and uh, the way that all that played out, uh, you know, this, this thing must have been planned for a long, very long time. Okay, so now, uh, Billy Lovelady, uh, as a father of young children, you got to think of uh, how pliable Lovelady would have been, you know, with all this situation, you know, with the FBI hanging over his head. Okay, mm -hmm. so then, you know, when Harold Weisberg, for example, when Harold Weisberg appeared before a grand jury during the Garrison investigation before the Clay Shaw trial in New Orleans in 1967, he was asked point blank if he thought that uh, Lovelady had been lying about his identification as doorway man in the Auction 6. And Weisberg answered with, a, with an emphatic yes. All right, now, hold on. Now, All we right. got the dean 
of research who spent his entire life and Jim Garrison saying that it was Billy Lovelady lying about being in the doorway. Yeah, yeah, and a colleague of ours, Roy Schaefer, who's done a lot of work on the Auction 6. Auction 6 has been obfuscated quite a bit there in the doorway, so there was a lot of uh, insistence on uh, other witnesses identifying Lovelady there at the doorway, so you, you never know, okay? Now, uh, Lovelady, uh, like I said, he refused to be photographed by anyone after the assassination, mm -hmm. and he was caught in this vortex, hounded throughout his life, and then he moved out to uh, Colorado to avoid investigators and others who wanted, wanted to talk to him. And then he died of a, of an, uh, of a heart attack you know, on January 14, 1979. Yeah. He was never interviewed by the House Select Commission, uh, Committee on, on Assassination. What year was that House Select Committee on Assassination? In 1979. In 1979, and and Billy dies uh, right when they were going to to interview him. Right you know, before. 2014. Right before. Yeah. Well, they did some. Supposedly, they contacted him, and they were in in conversations with him. And I, I'm going to talk about that now uh, because it's very very important because it has to do with the provenance of how the story of the shirt changed from one shirt to another, okay? And now, uh, when after Lovelady died, there was no autopsy performed, okay? Mm -hmm. Then later on, uh, uh, his wife Pat Patricia passed away in 1996 at the age of 57, so uh, both of them uh, died young, yes. okay? There, there are published articles that make reference to uh, HSCA Volume 6, uh, page 287. And this is the uh, reference that changed Lovelady's initial FBI report of 3264 that we talked about earlier that uh, they brought him in on 229.64 and took his picture and everything. And within this document, uh, there's a footnoted reference, and it's number 252, and it points, like I said before, to six seconds in Dallas, page 227. And this refers to an outside contact report that was done with Lovelady on 7578, and it quotes a document, and the, the number is 009727. Mm -hmm. Now, I looked for this document in all the HSCA uh, documentation, and it doesn't exist, okay? And an outside contact report, for example, must have, could have been a, a phone call or something, very informal information. So unless it's classified, this document doesn't exist. Okay, so what's that tell okay. us exactly? What's that telling us? Well, it tells us that the actual proof of of having spoken to Lovelady of, and Lovelady having changed his story about about the, the shirt that he was wearing doesn't exist. Mm -hmm. Okay, and so because there's no tangible and attributable evidence to support this conclusion. Now, the HSCA traces back to Josiah Thompson's book. Coincidentally, Thompson's uh, volume, quote, cites uh, Lovelady's unsigned deposition uh, in the Warren Commission, Wesley Frazier, Sarah Stanton, Bill Shelley, and Danny Arce provided uh, Warren Commission testimony about him being in the doorway. For some unknown reason, Thompson did not use this testimony as a reference. Thompson finished the Lovelady issue by quoting what he told CBS News regarding the shirt, but he doesn't give a date, nor does he offer any tangible evidence of this interview. I regard this as being non-existent, where you are begging the question, find the answer to uh, how they came up with, with this uh, reference, you know, it just doesn't exist. Mm -hmm. uh, CBS should have uh, videotaped uh, such an important statement, and they never did. Don't forget, this is where Lovelady changes his mind about the shirt, which is now long sleeved and patterned in large squares. It's just amazing so, that they would even pull something like that off. Yeah, well, given uh, what we now know about CBS and Time Life and other media giants during the Cold War and their intelligence connections, these statements by Lovelady are highly suspect and, and unlikely. <laughs> okay, we got we got to talk about here a little bit. Um, so are you saying that Billy G Lovelady was employed about a year and a half before the assassination? Yeah. Okay. That's right. So this could have been right. well into the planning. It's a high probability that he could be a potential patsy. I'm sure, I've always been told that there were multiple patches in case things went wrong. Well, yeah. Let me go a little bit into more detail on, on what you just said, uh, Gary, because uh, you had your Wesley Frazier 
and they found a 30-30 Enfield British rifle at his house when they searched the Randall residence, which was uh, Lenny May's house where uh, Wesley were, was staying at the time of the assassination. I so we're talking about rifle. Buell Wesley Frazier had a right. rifle found at his house, and what kind That's was right. it? British Enfield uh, rifle, 30-30 caliber. Okay. Okay, now, now the night of the assassination, they brought Wesley in. Captain Fritz tried to make him sign a confession that he was involved in the assassination. Okay. Now, that same night, the top brass of the Dallas Police Department, talking about captains, the assistant DA, Alexander, whoever Alexander went to see Joe Molina and woke him, woke him up at 1.30 in the morning. Later on, there's information that came out that what they were trying to find at uh, Joe Molina's house was some kind of evidence that would link him to Lee Oswald. What this tells us is that that same night of the assassination, they were still trying to link other uh, Confederates to uh, Lee Oswald, other conspirators, okay? And, and this whole situation was highly fluid. Mm -hmm. So we don't, we, at, that, at that time, that Friday the 22nd, they had not made up their mind to make uh, Lee Oswald the patsy and accuse him formally. So you, you already have, a, you got Love Lady who could have been a patsy, okay? You had your Wesley Frazier who could have been a patsy, Joe Molina, could have been a patsy. They, they, they sort of had this all worked out in a way where, for example, let, let me just give you a, a hypothetical situation here. What if uh, Lee Oswald had been caught in a lot more photographs outside of the TSPD, for example, that he might have decided to go watch the parade over at the curb, okay? Mm -hmm. So then they would have needed uh, some kind of fallback patsy. And we have information that uh, had the assassination not occurred there on, on Elm Street, it would have occurred probably uh, down the road on Stemmons Freeway, for example, on uh, next to uh, Corham uh, Motors. If you look at the Miller photograph, you'll see a sniper running with a rifle on the uh, parapet uh, on the roof of, of the uh, building next door to the Corham Motors, the famous Miller photograph that shows what we think about what they say was Clint Hill and, and a foot sticking out there over the door of the uh, limo, back door of the lim limousine. But uh, right in front, uh, there, there was a stadium called Cobb Stadium. <clears throat> and uh, there was a lot of reports coming into the uh, Dallas Police Department about uh, riflemen and, and snipers in, in that area. There, there were, uh, there were uh, obviously, uh, backup points. Mm -hmm. that, and what about the trademark? Been, uh, what about the trademark? Was that a potential assassination plot? I mean, site? Could have been. I, I don't have any information on, on uh, anything uh, there, but it, it's been very well established that the, the Cobb Stadium and the Quant Motors, right, which were right off of Stemmage Freeway, could have also been points where, where JFK could have been attacked had the Elm Street been aborted, had that uh, been abo ab aborted. That sort of gives us an idea of the magnitude of, the, of this whole plot here, you know. There's lingering questions about Billy Lovelady. You know, there still remains a lot to be investigated. For example, what exactly were his other activities and assignments at Andrews Air Force Base as a member of the base supply squadron? You know, was he proficient in handling of, uh, in the handling of guns and rifles? We know that there's uh, a lot of uh, information out there regarding rifles, uh, weapons trafficking at, at the TSBD. Okay, so, you know, there's, there's still a lot of questions regarding that. We talked about uh, Laura uh, Cottrell, you know, and how she, she wrote uh, that the Texas School Book Depository Company was famous for employing only clean candidates and how they frowned upon workers who had been dishonorably uh, discharged from the service. Lovelady, you know, ending up at the TSBD. As a fugitive from the FBI, who's yeah, been court-martialed, who's been convicted yeah. in civil court, is perfect yeah. if you're going to yeah. plan a route for the assassination of the president. Exactly. If you're going to plan a, a patsy, I mean, you know, they had uh, their patsies to choose from, you know. Mm -hmm. what's, what's really crazy about this, why was he not fired uh, for being arrested at his place of employment? If uh, the TSPD company, you know, was, was such a, a strict uh, employer, you know, I can't even imagine being arrested by the FBI at work. I just can't even imagine that.
Yeah, it does happen. And this you know, is just the stuff happens. that goes on all the time at the Texas School Book Depository. Yeah, right, right. <laughs> Did uh, Campbell ever, ever find out about the details of his felony and subsequent uh, court martial and discharge? Was there a prior relationship there? Uh, I mean, it, it, that's what it, this all indicates, that there was a relationship. You know, how else do you explain, you know, that, that he ends up working there? Then, you know, that he ended up starting a trucking business in Denver. And how did he do that? You know, he got to start a business. He needs money. To have the money. And uh, given his background and notoriety, you know, how, how, did, you know, how did that happen? And uh, finally, you know, could uh, Billy Lovelady, Oswald, Crawford, even Richard Case Nagel, and, you know, Richard Case Nagel is the guy that went into the El Paso, El Paso Bank, you know, and shot up the roof, you know, and just waited to be arrested, you know, because mm -hmm. he had been in the CIA and he had been around Oswald in New Orleans and he knew about the plot. Dick Russell writes a very, very convincing book about how Richard Case Nagel could have also been a patsy in this whole thing. And then even Thomas Arthur Valley, you know, the guy in Chicago that got, uh, got arrested. So all these guys, you know, what? The common link that of all these guys that I just mentioned is they were they were in the military at one time or another. The, for example, this Krafar has got discharged because he was crazy, and and all these guys could have been steered and influenced in one way or another uh, because of threats, perhaps of, of dishonorable discharge, which is the case happened uh, to be the case with Lee Oswald. You know, he was dishonor honor dishonorably discharged, and he was fighting to get that uh, corrected. Precisely, that's uh, the reason why Dean Andrews in, in New Orleans, who was working on, on that for him, doing that for him, you know, trying to uh, correct his uh, dishonorable uh, discharge, trying, trying to reverse that. Yeah, very interesting. So, uh, very interesting parallel between Lee Oswald and Billy Lovelady being dishonorably discharged. Yeah, and, and also uh, Larry Kafar had the same situation. So all these guys, you know, were in the military at one time or another and during this time. This could have been some kind of patsy club, you know, from which the conspiracy, uh, conspirators uh, could have drawn from. And finally, I got to talk about this because this is really amazing to me. Patricia Lovelady attempted to sell the checkered shirt that uh, that they photographed Billy Lovelady in, in 1971, the one that, that I spoke about earlier with uh, Tom Jackson. And uh, she approached uh, Harold Weisberg. And she called him one day. She wanted to offer the shirt, and she wanted five thousand dollars for the shirt. She offered. <laughs> she wanted five thousand dollars from Harold Weisberg. I don't think That's he was right. that That's rich at the time. Right. That was a lot of money back then. <laughs> Obviously, you know, he turned her down. And another thing uh, that uh, I wanted to talk about briefly is the name uh, Kenneth Bruton. He was counsel for the HSCA, you know, the House Select uh, Committee on Assassinations, in the seventies. And he investigated part of the uh, Lovelady uh, deal, okay? And later on, he ends up being Lovelady's personal attorney. <laughs> how okay? convenient. Now, well, how, how does this happen? I mean, there's so many questions here and so many issues here that are still unanswered about Billy Lovelady. And they still need to be investigated by researchers. I believe it's Ken... Ken Boone is still around, uh, living in Florida in the Orlando area. Uh, he's never been heard from. Finally, in a strange twist of fate, I don't know if you you know these guys, uh, uh, special agents from the FBI, Francis O'Neill and James Seibert, from uh, Seibert and O'Neill fame. This, uh, these were the two guys uh, that were at the autopsy the night of uh, 11-22nd that uh, David Lipton uh, wrote a whole book uh, about based on what they wrote about regarding the, the autopsy. Well, anyway, this Francis O'Neill was one of the agents that investigated the gun-running case at Andrews. <laughs> so, you know, this whole thing is sort of like comes full circle here, you know, and there's a lot of angles uh, to the Billy Lovelady uh, situation and the JFK assassination. Yeah, it seems like a small world when it comes to this JFK thing. It, it yeah. seems to be massive, but it also seems to be a very, very small world. All right, so to round it out, it appears that we have Billy Lovelady, more than just a guy mistaken as Lee Oswald, the accused assassin in the doorway. We have a man Absolutely. who has an FBI record, been arrested by the FBI, has been court-martialed, and has been convicted in civil court, has children, and has never once cooperated 
with any of these questions and would all in fact you could get in a fight if you tried to get, take a picture of him walking out the school book depository and i'll bet they had him walking out the back <laughs> i bet he, he yeah. rarely went out the front yeah 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 and and uh we've tried to uh, track down that he when he was married to patricia uh, patricia had already had two kids they had uh, another a couple of kids uh, after they got married but she already had a couple of kids to this man by the name of Exit. Richard Hook and I tracked down both of them, uh, Timothy and Angela, tried to find out, you know, if they could, you know, give us their impression, you know, on their stepfather. You know, we sent letters, and we knew exactly where they lived and everything. You know, we were able to use the Internet to find them. They never answered us, obviously. They, they're still hiding out there, you know, somewhere, and they know things that other people don't know. <laughs> All right, so to speak. <laughs> yeah, Harold Weisberg seemed to have had it right. I mean, uh, Billy Lovelady is no small player in this whole, whole no. toward affair. No, 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 he's not. No, he's not. And uh, you know, he was he was pressured into all this. In fact, Beverly Brunson had some very interesting writings about uh, Lovelady. She actually believed that Lovelady wore that shirt. Uh, to the FBI on purpose to give them some kind of wiggle room, you know, out of this whole thing, and to maybe give the investigators some kind of lead here on what, what the uh, FBI and what the Warren Commission was really trying to do, and that's also a possibility, you know. So we're talking uh, Beverly Bronson in 1968, saying this. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Yeah, because she also did a, a lot of investigating into the uh, Six uh, photograph. She was convinced it was Lee in the, in the doorway. Absolutely, 100 percent. But uh, she also uh, thought that, that there was more to the love lady story than uh, than, uh, than was being revealed, and she was right. We know a heck of a lot more now than we know then. I right, we have about a minute left, Larry. Um, how come Harold's Harold Weisberg's work isn't cited more often? Harold had was a very <laughs> controversial uh, figure in, in, in the JFK community. He had. He made a lot of enemies, you know, he made a lot of had strange relationships with people, you know. It doesn't, it doesn't take away from the enormous volume of work, and he, he worked the, all the way to, until the day he died on the uh, JFK assassination and, and securing so many documents for us that, uh, in fact, uh, if you visit his, his, his website at, at Hood College, there are, there are just millions and millions of documents, and you could write maybe uh, 500 books based on the information that's, that's there. First of all, you know, he didn't believe that the uh, Zapruder film had been altered. So I think that's basic conclusion that, uh, that, that we have, you know, today. There were other, a lot of other things, you know, that he, he was very strict as far as his sources, and he was very jealous about other people using his sources and very protective. He always uh, wanted to be cited correctly, and and the attribution, you know, to his work was very important to him. He had uh, some very interesting relationships with his peers, for example, with Salandria and Marr and and Feynman and and people like that, and and uh, Maggie Field and Shirley Martin. Even Robert Groton, and, and oh, I, I forgot, I wanted to uh, mention that there was, a, there was a document that was signed in 1976, and it, it's a receipt, it, not a receipt, but a, a statement made by, supposedly made by Billy Lovelady, where he's affirming that he is the man in the doorway. Who are the people that witnessed and who signed onto this, this statement if they're not Kenneth Bruton and at the bottom, Robert Groton? on 11-13-1976. Wow. And All right, well, <laughs> yeah, we're going to have to call it right there, Larry. Great show. All right, when it comes to Lee Harvey Oswald,